How's everybody doing? Hello? This working? Yeah, now it is. How's everybody doing? Woo! Four days of Blender, yeah! <laughs> Hi, uh, so I'm going to be talking about architecture is beauty. Uh, my name is Dimitar Pushnikov. I'm from Bulgaria, and I'm an architect, as you might have guessed by now. Uh, yeah. Let's see if this thing is... Uh, I think this is not working. Okay. There you go. Cool. So a little bit about me. I said I'm an architect already. I spent most of my education time, well, it's split between the US and the UK, uh, but most of my professional time in the UK working as on big projects, international projects, which you're going to see. And the really interesting part about that is that most of it is done with Blender, which I bet you didn't know that you can do that with architecture design. So not architectural visualization, but design. Uh, at the moment, I run UH Studio, which is my own company, architecture design practice, and I'm really passionate about showing architects and designers, and also 3D artists that are interested in architecture, how to use Blender as part of their toolkit. So that's one of my massive passions. Right, so yeah, let's talk about design. So what is design? To me, Probably if I ask all of you, you might have a different idea, but it's where beauty and function meet. How? And how does Blender play into this? Well, we'll check out. But first, I want to bring you back with me about too many years ago now, like 12, 13, at my postgraduate school. It's called the AA School in London. It's actually a small school that if you're an architect, you probably never heard of it. But if you are an architect, you definitely heard of it. Uh, and it's, I did the design research lab, which is a postgraduate Denmark program. And that thing was super cool. As you can see, we got down and dirty. Not only with physical things, but also with digital. We were doing like all kinds of strange, weird scripts with Python, with processing at that point, uh, with Maya. We were playing a lot with physical, trying to uh, simulate some things physically, and then thinking about how those things could potentially look uh, digitally, and just going back and forth the whole time. Uh, and so iteration was a really important part of the process. And in case you're wondering, a lot of these studies were done with Maya, with Tenhair, back in the day. I did use Blender at that point, but you know, as a student, you're like, wow, so many new cookies. Which one do I take to play with? Uh, but the most important thing that I got from there was experiment, iterate, evaluate, and repeat. And I suspect it's probably true for a lot of you, even if you're not architects and designers. So let's switch big gears a little bit here. So let's talk about beauty. So what is beauty? All right, yeah, that's beautiful, right? Beautiful face, but uh, what is beautiful architecture? So this is one of my favorite places in London. It's only five and a half hours from here. If you take the Eurostar to St. Pancras Station, and it's walking distance away from St. Pancras Station, and it's called the Coal Drops Yard, and it's merging old with new. And why is it beautiful? Because it provides an excellent sense of place and identity. And it's, so you can see the design, right? It's got like these things, the, the roof that sort of goes around and the public space that it forms. So this is, yeah, I think I mentioned it, Heatherwick Studio. So it's not my project, but I absolutely love it because they show the process on their website, so I can talk about it because that's the importance, right? So that's the original image that you see there, the satellite photo of two warehouses. So this is in an old industrial area that you, you cannot recognize it anymore because they've completely taken the industry out and now it's a really nice and quite central area. Uh, so what was their concept? It was creating these coal warehouses, train warehouses, into a really beautiful space, church-like space is what they wanted, with a dome in the middle. So of course they had to iterate a lot to get to that concept. And here's some of the 
models that they did. And it's quite interesting because you have the concept, right? Their concept was to have a dome in the middle, but the design solutions to get to that dome could be very different, right? So these all satisfied the design criteria, but they chose one, and I think they chose the right one, and the uh, iter iterative process doesn't stop. It continues throughout the design process until we get to the final solution. So code drops the art. Make sure you check it out if you go to London. And that process is very important to all of the architectural projects. This is another one. This is by Zaka Khadir Architects, and it's in Saudi Arabia in Riyadh. So the first image that you see on top, that's their winning competition entry, which, OK, looks great. But look where they got to with all the iterations, right? And it's actually almost built, right? So it's really fantastic. So is that what we call beautiful functionality? I guess, yes. And uh, is this beautiful functionality, though? Well, kind of, but not really, right? So uh, these are images that I've done, which are like for Pavilion, but they're for a workshop that I did with some university students a couple of years back. And so how, does it, how do you separate one from the other, right? Because this does look beautiful. Um, it, it's, it is a pavilion, but it doesn't have like the programmatic requirements, so specific criteria that we're trying to generate to, to meet that. So it's not quite that, even though it is quite beautiful. So let's get back to this project that you saw in the beginning. So this is all designed with Blender, right? So I was a project designer for this project, which is not too far from the uh, metro station that I showed you. It's in Saudi Arabia as well. And so how do you get to this? How do you design something like that, right? Because it's got a lot of things going on. You see there's people moving. It's a landscape. But you also have some areas in there which are retail spaces, some restaurant spaces, event spaces. And you have to be able to move around from that. So that's what I want to talk about is take you on this design journey with me. So first, we start with like some simple diagrams to understand the context. We have to understand the proximity, how we move to there, uh, how do we go around. And then because we're designing an event space, we have to understand what kind of events are happening there. Uh, and that's something that we all designed within our group. I was the project designer for this project, by the way. And so we have to map that out, right? But this is not quite designed yet. But we really need to understand the spatial parameters, the programmatic elements that go in there to, to generate this kind of criteria. So we knew we wanted an event space, and we have to test what kinds of sizes work and what we can fit in there. And then we have to also think about how do we combine some of these elements together. Right, so if we want to have smaller events, we can have like a scenario where we have like one really big event or a bunch of really small events. So this here, this is not design yet, right? This is just the criteria to get to the design. And what's really fascinating is that these three options here, they all the, the, the actual design proposals are quite different, but they all satisfy that cr criteria that you saw so before that. Right, so we c this, this is just a fraction of the design proposals that we did for the criteria that you saw. And they're all quite different. They start out with sketches, right? And this is where Blender comes in. So all this was designed with Blender. And uh, I can't remember now, because this was about four years back now. Uh, and when we designed, I probably had two hours to start with this. And eventually, you know, we go back and we refine and so on. So how do you do this in Blender? So however you can, basically, right? So you find like whatever works for you for the project. And what's fascinating about Blender is the fact that we can be quite procedural about it. So in this case, it, it's not very complicated, right? So we have like a, uh, two sides that were modeled, and then we have like a, a bridge behind it. This one was a bit more complicated, but again, it starts out quite simple and straightforward. So you create one hexagon, hexagon, right? So then you create an array in one direction, create an array in the other direction. You flood it so it fits the whole site. Then you use the lattice modifier to deform it, so it kind of grows because you can see we have our bridge, which is part of our landscape, because it's probably the widest bridge in the world. It's, it's quite large. And then we have to break it down. So this was done before geometry nodes four years ago, right? So if I were to do it now, because I had to manually start to break it and sort of create like those steps 
that you see moving around. Uh, we probably could have used the tractors to do that with, within geometry nodes. Uh, and this is the scheme that we said, oh, no, not with those crazy hats, right? Because they're a bit nuts. But uh, the idea was to kind of uh, take it down and have like this dune-like experience, which is more smooth, so you can sort of flow up the landscape. And within there, we already, as I was designing this, we had some specific zones that we were trying to map. So there's an event space, as you can see, restaurant areas, and those all had to be designed within the actual landscape. And how was this designed? So this is the first iteration with some kind of awkward canopies, you know, copy and paste. And that's the more final iteration where you really feel how the bridge, you know, you have this sort of grid you, which trips, right? And then the bridge is almost like flows into the space, right? And it starts to create this really beautiful pattern. And you probably guessed by now how this is done. Right, so you start with a straight grid, and then you, get, you create some lattices to move around. And then there's some pieces that they're kind of add-on in a quite separate ways. So I'll show you a snapshot of the model in a little bit. So within here, we have to satisfy all the design criteria that you saw before. And that's the importance of design, right? We're not just creating 3D for the sake of 3D. We're creating 3D with the idea that we really understand how this is going to impact our architecture, our design. Once we're done with the basic design, we're never done, right? I mean, we're never done. We can go on and on and on. But within here, we have to go back and now look. This is just one example of the event space. And we want to make sure that the event space works with all the kinds of scenarios that you saw before and beyond, but thinking about it more diagrammatically. So that's a very important step. Sometimes we do it, as you see here, in diagram form. Sometimes we do it in 3D with concepts, with uh, just putting it everything and so we have a better understanding. And that's how the project starts to look like, right? So we have, like, in this case, it looks not so much as a landscape, but quite urban, just because of the angle that this image was taken from. Uh, this is not Blender, by the way. We hired a uh, external architectural visualization company called Meshroom to do these. Uh, but I'll show you the ones that I have done with Blender also. Uh, so in here, you, you kind of get like this excitement, I think, between these two levels. And once you see it from different angles, then it does start to look more landscape-like. Uh, and a funny story here is you, you see the buildings over there. So those buildings, there's somebody, and this happens a lot, right, in architecture offices. Uh, we had an idea that we're going to put some hotels. It's a hotel, but it's just some blocks because there was no architect for it. So we go, how about we design something? We show it to the client, and maybe they'll like it, and they'll hire us to do that design as well. Uh, so it's something that was modeled in maybe like one hour, two hours max to be able to do this. So there's always this, you know, okay, we, we go and we have to design a lot, but then sometimes we, we have these like really, really limited times to be able to design. And again, that's where Blender is, is quite important in that design process. So that's the snapshot of the model. At this point, I had worked on it for quite a while, so it's not that procedural and a bit hacky, right? You can probably notice some parts don't flow quite well into it, but that's not the important part. We don't want to have the absolute perfect topology and the perfect model at all times. We want to do whatever we need to do in whichever way to get to the right design solution as quickly as possible. And sometimes that requires hacks, right? So sometimes, you know, you have to put things on top. Sometimes you use Booleans to move things around. Uh, you do whatever it is, but you try to keep it, I try to keep it at least, as procedural as possible for as long as possible so we can get, you know, if we need to move around, because we move things around quite a bit, uh, easier. So that's uh, the, the wall at my, at my old architectural office with all the information of what it takes to, and actually it's just a part of it, you know, for, you know, diagrams, references, you can see where it says one, two, three, four, these were like some of the options that you see. So, in a way, software doesn't matter, but it does. I didn't talk so much about software when I was showing you the design solution, but it does help because we can iterate faster and hopefully, not always, but hopefully, 
more iterations equal better design. Now, I did want to show you here like another super cool project that I use Blender for architecture design for, which is meant, and don't, don't tell that to anybody, the tallest tower in the world. But I can't mention that. Maybe in 10 years' time when it gets built, but it's not going to be our concept that gets built. Somebody else's, because they had to restart the competition, but big NDAs and so on. Anyways, I will show you another pretty cool project. So this is uh, a mixed-use development. This is in Lagos in Nigeria. These were also rendered with Blender. I, I just do them on the site when, whenever I can. Uh, but I really focus more on design. But you know, being able to present your work is very important as well. So in this project, we've got hotels, we have office, we have residential, and the two towers one is called Cerulean, the other one is Indigo. They have different characters. One, one is more exquisite, let's say, more refined, and the other one is strong, bold, and grounded. Uh, and the design is between Rhino and Revit, and these are the programs that most architects tend to use. But the facade on the Cerulean one was designed with the help of Blender. And when we design facades, we also have to have specific criteria. So how much openings do we need? How much do they extrude? What do we do with the ends? And we always use some references when we do that. We also have to consider the di different kinds of zones. For example, a residential facade looks a little bit different than an office facade. You have terraces. Whereas in office, you don't have terraces. And then we have some public spaces that should probably have a slightly different character as well. So this is, again, just a fraction of the tests that we need to do to get to a good facade solution, all done with the help of Blender, of course. With the little bands, you know, do they go uh, thick and white, or you know, are they conve convex, concave, concave? Are they flat? But at some point, we decided to try having those bands, but also connecting them vertically. And this, in blend this was generated in Blender, right? We have a small chunk with subdiv. Then we use the array modifier and then the mirror modifier. We always have to make sure within architecture that what we design for the most part, although you know my designs, even though they're all buildable from what you saw at the moment, we still have to have a sanity check, right? Like, so how can we penalize this? How do we unitize it in order to make it work? And the building is currently in uh, construction, right? And uh, not just another render to see what it's going to start looking like. And this is how the facade was really built in Blender, right? So we start with one component, then it's mirrored, then we use one array in one direction, then a second array in another direction, then a lattice modifier to deform the two longer sides because it starts all looking exactly the same, and then the curve modifier to put it onto the footprint, to deform it around the footprint, and then another lattice because some of the levels have different uh, heights onto it, and then Boolean because I needed to remove uh, some parts on top of it. So super simple in a way, right? And you, you, you guys know this because we, you use Blender. But if you had to do this somewhere else and have such a flexible setup that I need to just go in there and try to move things around, that would be extremely difficult and time consuming. So Blender is probably one of the best design tools for this kind of work. And so faster iterations hopefully again, for the most part, equal more beautiful and sensible design. <coughs> and so we really have to embrace like technology. And I, you know, some people are kind of afraid of technology. Probably nobody here, right? We're all, yes, Blender, you know, nobody uses it in, you know, my studio, my office, whatever, I'm going to learn it. So I feel like this group here, we all really do embrace technology. But you know, in the wider world out there, people don't embrace technology perhaps, in the same manner. And I think it's really important to play with things and to understand how we can create things, even if it's not directly related to a project, because at some point, it could end up as a project. So let me speak a little bit more about that. So we've got one aspect. So this is a module that repeats, basically. And this is done with the tissue add-on, by the way, which you saw the wonderful presentation before. Uh, so it's completely modular and completely parametric. So if we were to take this a step further, we have something like this, which is actually a course that I, I've done. You can check it out. I'll show you the links later in case anybody's interested to do that. So that's actually one kind of iteration, right, for the course to get to something that uh, 
I can teach in four hours. But to get to that point, there was also iteration. Uh, so I had to design this three times. Actually, my wife has this golden rule. She said, I tell her, it's going to take me one hour. And she says, so I'm going to see you in three hours. You know, so that's <laughs> the goal. So anytime I try to do something, it usually takes me three hours to do it. Right? So this is a, some kind of like a quite interesting water pavilion. And the way it's modeled, again, is completely uh, procedural or parametric is the word, word we like to use in architecture, essentially procedural. Uh, so it's one chunk that's modeled, then it's mirrored, and then I'm using a, a polar array with an empty, so basically an array with an empty to create a polar array to fix that, to, to, to sort of have the, all the different elements connected. So fairly simple procedural setup. Uh, and then, as I showed you before, I had to go back and sort of simplify this so I can teach it in a four-hour workshop to people that have never used a Blender before. <coughs> So what about smaller scale? Can you use that? And I think the iterative design process, criteria-driven design process, is the same no matter which scale you work in. You, know, it, you could be working on even a character, I suppose, right? You can be working on a setting, on a movie, your movie set. You always, we always have to refine. Uh, so this is a house that I designed and sometimes I don't know if it ever happens to you, but I had this project sitting around. That's what it looked like. It's beautiful. It's, this, it's actually the S house, uh, which is designed again. Well, it's just subdiff, I guess, in this point, and a mirror modifier. But then, as I was browsing the internet, Instagram, I was uh, horrible. Who invented social media? I don't know. But I guess it has its uses as well, right? Uh, and at some point, I just see a picture, and I'm like, wow, this would be absolutely perfect to go in there. But this took at least three times to rebuild as well. Oof. So at one point, you know, I was feeling a little bit down, and I decided, and as any architect probably thought about at some point, is I want to design my own house. Maybe it will get built, maybe you won't, but I want to design it. So this took probably 10 iterations, starting from scratch to get to a level where I was actually you know, comfortable and I said, okay, now this finally works. Uh, I didn't include too much information, but you can check it out on uh, my website. Uh, but basically, it's based around the golden ratio. So all the plans, all the spaces, they're proportional to, to one another. And uh, I spend a lot of time on the interiors in here as well to make it work. So it's actually, I think it's important to show you that because uh, the iterative design process is for all design projects. You don't have to have organic geometry to do that, subdiv-based geometry to do it. And the interiors were... Uh, a combination of retro-futurism with some curves along with Japanese architecture, which I'm a big fan of, of having, you know, beautiful timber slats with light passing through them. So again, for great design, actually, software does matter, as long as your head is full with good ideas. And embracing the design, so how do we do that? So we, we have to keep an eye out, outside of design, and just start to play with manipulating form and being able to uh, design and work with different formal elements. I always have an architect's mind, so even when I'm doing these massings, I'm thinking, how can they actually be turned into architecture? How do I put floors in there? What could the facade look like? But most of the time, it's just experimenting with different workflows. So most of these were done with the tissue add-on, which, which are just basic tessellations. So everything is kept fairly parametric, right? So we can really manipulate the form as much as we want. And you know, some of these were done for various different workshops or just for fun to experiment with how we can provide this kind of formal experiments that could potentially, like I see them, you probably don't, but I see them as the possibility of creating buildings with those. And if you learn enough of like those little techniques, you can sort of combine them to start to create some beautiful massing. In this case, I do call it only a massing still. It's not an architectural project because I don't have a criteria to say I need so and so many square meters of this kind of space in there. But you can imagine now, right? This could really easily turn into that. And all of these, by the way, this I have uh, uh, on, on uh, YouTube. 
a uh, video that's showing you exactly how to do this step by step in case you're interested. Again, it's all parametric and done with the tissue add-on, but it's got a slightly tricky thing that the panels in this case have to be uh, on a diagonal, so they have to be designed to be as a diagonal into there. So it's really important for me to keep experimenting even outside of projects. So when a project does come, I feel better equipped to be able to show how that can be actually made. <coughs> and then going back to where we started, which was the urban realm, you know, Amsterdam, absolutely beautiful city, by the way, isn't it? Because it works so well architecturally. You feel out on the street, it's quiet, it doesn't have cars, we have like really nice walls. This is a bit different, right? Uh, again, I'm more of an architect than an architectural visualizer, so when I do my visualizations, I, I'm a little bit lazy, so it takes a lot of effort to put this with, uh, in an environment, in an urban environment, so that's why I put it in the water, right? Uh, but this was designed for another course. Uh, it's more the curved building that you see on the, which image is it? Oh, on that image over there. But I thought, okay, so how do we sort of push what I can do with Blender to start to show like the whole context almost in real time. This is rendered with uh, cycles, but it can be, you know, I can manipulate it very quickly because it's quite lightweight. And that form, it's actually fairly simply built. You know, it's a um, sub-diff again. My, I guess my workflow at this point is a little bit similar. I design a chunk, I mirror it, and then I rotate it, you know, whether with array, I think this, w this time it was with geometry nodes, and then it's using the simple deform modifier to twist it. The floors, they're one plane, array, then using the Boolean modifier, and then uh, extruding down to add a little bit of depth. Um, and some of the other twisted buildings that you see in this image over here, they were done with uh, tissue add-on as well. You have a base mass, and then you use the tissue add-on. So, but in here, what's important is that Blender gives us like this, not only a place to design, but also a place to see what we're designing and put it in a context, put people, put trees, put all the aspects that give you a sense of scale. So you understand how you would imagine the space to be. And there's some more images of that. And uh, yeah, so my passion is really about showing architects and designers how to think about, at least to think about how to use Blender. Uh, so I teach a summer course as well to university students where it's a bit dictatorial, but they must use Blender. So in my course, you know, in my unit, they have to use Blender. And it is a challenge, you know, so these are maybe third or fourth year university students that never used Blender before because I'm not only teaching them how to model, but I'm also teaching them how to think like architects, right? So similar to the design criteria you saw for the landscape project before, something like that has to occur over here as well. Uh, and on top of that, learn how to model that in Blender. So there's always a little bit of struggle, but I think the results are fairly nice. And I continue with that. Uh, so yeah, that's about it. Uh, so you can check out my projects at uhstudio.com. Uh, and I try to collaborate with people as well. I'm actually quite interested in movies and seeing like maybe some of these in like a scene or something. Um, and I have a YouTube channel as well, which you can check out where, oh yeah, that's the video that I was talking about with a tessellated diagrid where you can do it. And also some courses. Uh, people always ask me whether I use geometry nodes, which I didn't talk too much about here, but I actually have like the staggered building forms is exactly taking like little massings and then understanding how with either with modifiers or with geometry nodes, we can turn these into architectural concepts really quickly. So thank you so much. And thank you to Blender and to everybody else that's here. <laughs>